Hello again and welcome back to our course on SharePoint Foundation 2013. In this section we're going to look at users, groups and permissions. We looked at permissions earlier on in terms of some basic concepts but this time not only we're going to look at it in a bit more detail but we're going to set up a couple more users because from this point onwards in the course I need to simulate a number of different people using the system. Now one of the first things I need to point out to you is that there's a fundamental difference in terms of users between Office 365 SharePoint Online and between the on-premises solutions. Now as I've mentioned a couple of times already I'm running this course using an on-premise solution and with an on-premise solution you cannot have external users by default. Now I'm not going to go into this in a great amount of detail, I'll just explain it in fairly straightforward terms. Because an on-premise solution has a very different licensing arrangement with Microsoft than the online versions, in effect all of your users should have client access licenses or CALs. Now it's not quite as straightforward as that in the case of SharePoint, but it does mean that you cannot just throw open an on-premises SharePoint installation to anybody you want to be able to log in and use it. Therefore, who can access it and how they access it, and indeed the extra software needed to access it for external users, is quite a complicated subject. So in this course I am only going to be using internal users. These are going to actually appear to be members of the same domain as me, the weteachproject.com domain. And I'm going to have four or five users all in that domain. They're my internal users. Now one thing that I can do is to have anonymous users. And I'll talk to you briefly about anonymous users a little bit later on in this unit. If you are using an Office 365 SharePoint Online solution, this restriction does not apply. There is an administration setting on a site which basically determines whether external users are allowed or not. And in fact, by default, external users are allowed. So you actually have to make an effort to disallow external users. I'm not going to cover that here, but if you are using a SharePoint Online version and you want a mix of what might loosely be called internal users and external users, then make sure that external users are allowed via the central administration system on your SharePoint Online installation. By external users, in a sense we mean just somebody you have an email address for. You can email them details of the site, you can restrict what they do, and then they can come along, they can log in, they can set their own password, etc. As I say, I've got four or five internal users, people that share my domain, and I'm going to set them up as users of this SharePoint site in this unit. The first thing to mention is that I'm once again at the top of the site collection and when you administer users and groups etc you'll very often administer those for the whole of a site and all its subsites. But if I wanted a different structure, different users, different groups, different permissions at a lower level subsite I could do but I would need to break the inheritance for that lower level subsite because once I set these users groups permissions up here they basically cascade down to the whole of the structure underneath SPF 2013 in this case unless at some point I break that inheritance. But in the interests of being quick for the moment I'm going to set up these users groups and permissions for the whole of this site and all its subsites. So the first thing to do is to go into the gear, site settings, and let's have a look in this section now, users and permissions. The first thing I want to look at is site collection administrators. Now site collection administrators I certainly only can do anything to, provided I am a site collection administrator. There is the list of site collection administrators and not surprisingly the only person in it is me. If I wanted to give one of my colleagues site administration rights then this is the point at which I would add that person to this list of administrators. 
I would very strongly recommend that you always do have two administrators because of the under a bus syndrome as it's referred to in the UK and also of course to cover things like vacation holiday periods periods of sickness and so on I'm just going to stick with me here but as I say I suggest you have two all you need to do to add an administrator is to add a second name on there with the two separated by semicolons so I'm not going to make any changes there I'll just click on cancel now before we move on, I'd just like to look at the last option in the Users and Permissions section there. It says Site App Permissions. We will almost certainly find that that is currently empty. When you install apps on a SharePoint installation, the app may need, in fact often will need, specific permissions to access or do certain things. And it's here that those permissions would be recorded. This will normally be done at or at the time of the installation of the app. We don't really need to worry about that on this course, so just accept the fact that that's empty, if indeed it is. And what we're going to look at next is people and groups. Now here's a little feature that we haven't seen very often so far. Over on the right here there's a little drop down for the view. This particular list of groups we have two alternative views for. We have a detail view and a list view and I can use that control on the right there to change the view. Something we'll be looking at a little bit more later on. So back at the list of existing groups, there are three groups and they're the three groups that are created by default when the site is created. So we have the site name, members, owners, visitors. As I click on each group, I will see the members of that group. So in this case, with the members group, it's Toby A. With owners, it's Toby A. With visitors, it's Diane D. Now in terms of what each of those groups can do, if I click on more, I see that the members group basically have contribute permission. So they're the people that can contribute to the site. The owners group has full control and the visitors group can read. Now it's a little bit more complicated than that as we saw earlier on, but that's a good way to think of what each of those groups can do. So the first thing I'm going to do now is to add one of my colleagues to the owners group. Now first of all I need to share the site with her and then assign her as part of that process to being in the owners group. So I click on share in the top right hand corner there. And then to identify my colleague enter a personalized message and then in the options down here I can optionally send an email invitation and I can also specify which group or permission level I want to assign to Bryony initially. Now I'm going to put her into the owners group so just click on share And as usual, if I do a refresh, I can now see that Bryony is in the owners group. And now I'd like to add one of my other colleagues, Carl, to the members group. So go to members, and this time, instead of using the share option, what I'm going to do is once the members group is selected, I'm going to click on new add user to this group. The dialogue is very similar but it specifically states members group and you don't have to put in the full email address if you know the username within Active Directory of your user so in this case Carl C that'll be fine it'll sometimes say no results found if you know the users there it isn't going to be a problem so there's the message I'm going to send Carl an email invitation, click on share, and now you can see that Carl has been added to that group as well. And in this case, it's automatically done a refresh. So in that way, I can build up the list of people in each of my groups. 
Now let me point out a couple of useful things here. I've got the members group selected. I have two of my users in there, myself and Carl. And if I click on the Actions button up here, note the options I have. I have an Email Users option and I can select one or more of the members of this group and send an email to all of them. I can call the selected users. Again, I can make a selection and call the selection. And I can select one or more users and remove them from the group. So these are the fundamental actions that I can use for contacting members of the group and removing people from the group. If you click on Settings, you can see quite a long list of settings there that relate to the various aspects of what you can see here. So there are group settings, group permissions, I can make a particular group the default group for new people to be added to, and I can also manage the list here, list settings, manage settings such as columns and views. So when I'm in this particular page within Peoples and Groups, there's actually quite a lot I can do in terms of administration and management as well. So that's how we can add members to existing groups. One of the other things you need to be able to do is to add a new group. Now, this is a little bit ahead of what we need at the moment, but I'll just briefly show you how to do it. So, first of all, if I click on that More button again, or indeed on Groups, above the list of groups there, I see the list of available groups with a description of each of them, and one of the options is New, and I can create a new group. Now, when it comes to assigning permissions within SharePoint, as with many other aspects of Windows software, it's usually a good idea to assign permissions on the basis of groups rather than individual people. Having said that, there will be occasions when you will want to assign permissions to an individual person. But working on the principle that generally we try to use groups, you may find a need to create a specific group yourself. So for instance, if we anticipated that the finance aspects of what we do would have a special significance and require some specific permissions, we might create a finance group and put certain members of the finance team in there so that they have a peculiar set of permissions compared to everybody else, shall we say. So we can put in a name of the group and a description of the group. We can declare or change who the group owner is. We can then say who can view the membership of the group. Everyone can or just the group members. Who can edit the membership of the group, the group owner or any of the group members. So there's quite a long list of options there. And when you've selected from all the available options, including things like do you allow people to request to join the group? So do you let people send an email to somebody to say, can I join the group? So there's a whole list of options there in terms of creating a new group. And if we need to, later on in the course, we may create a group. For instance, as I mentioned just now, perhaps that finance group as an example. If you change your mind, I don't need to use it. Click on Cancel. Now that leaves us with one other aspect of users, groups and permissions to look at in a little more detail and that is to look at permissions. We're going to cover those in the next section so please join me for that.